One of the hardest parts about being an artist is learning how to make a living doing it, or just how to get started. It's always fun and comforting to be sitting in your studio just doing your work. Today we learn how one takes the love of doing art in the studio and brings it to the masses through doing street fairs, performing at workshops, and selling their art online. Today's artist has made a professional living selling their art doing all these things. We welcome Stephen Corey. Hey everyone, hi, I'm Steve Corey. This is my studio. I built this um, to be a studio and it's just been a wonderful space for me. And the magical thing about this studio is when I walk in that door, everything stays out here that should be out here and inside is creativity and fun. Steven's paintings feature hyper-realistic renderings of swampland, nature scenes, birds, down to the tiniest of creatures. In fact, he wrote a book about painting nature's tiniest creatures that you can find in the bookstores or online that details step-by-step -step instructions of how he does his paintings. He is a highly skilled and sought out wildlife artist who only paints the animals that he sees out in the wild himself. I grew up in a, a real conducive environment for art. My dad was a high school art teacher head of a high school art department. My okay. family were all in education. My, my mom, my real mom passed, but my stepmom had pretty much raised me, was a superintendent. And so there was a lot of, a lot of art in our family. And, and dad was, he was a potter. He was really good sketching and really good 3D stuff, pottery. But he always encouraged me. My grandmother painted for a living. Um, I grew up in rural Northern Arizona. The town was maybe 5,000 people on its best day but it was surrounded by all this beautiful country around it. You know, I'm probably like you grew up out there in the hills and <clears throat> always felt closer to God out in nature than anywhere I've ever been. Right. And so it was just, you know, putting that art together, I think it's kind of a respect for what I see and wanting to paint what I see. And, and my dad always encouraged it. He's still stunned, he's passed, but I think he was still stunned I could make a living doing it. I mean, absolutely. He, and once I started doing art shows and stuff, he would get to go to a show with me, like one in Tempe or one in, we, we'd go out west and he'd do some of those shows. And I'd love to look on his face. And after shows, he'd, you know, he'd be in the back of the booth closing up and he'd go, I can't believe you're doing this good. Yeah, especially you know? as a living, because that's yeah. one of the hardest things to do yeah. as an artist. So I guess I grew up around art and I always wanted to. And my dad was really, we, where I grew up, um, it was right next to the Navajo and Hopi reservations in Arizona. And those kids, came from the reservation, stayed in Holbrook in this dormitory for the BLM and, and they, would, they would all take my dad's art classes and they were really good artists because they didn't have the exposure, the distractions us kids that lived in town did. I mean, they, they'd sit out with sheep or out in the hills and they'd look and sketch and they were really good. So dad, he would give them canvases and paint and they would paint in, the work, in his classes and he'd have me come down and sit and paint with them and we would trade out paintings and then he'd take their paintings and sell them to the curio shops and give the kids the money. So it was, it was like I watched other people paint, my dad was encouraging, and he provided all the stuff. So it was just, and I think that's where I learned to just get into something and everything else went away. So the studio was sort of envisioned as being a place with a lot of windows where we could get a lot of natural light in. And that's what it's become now, is I can up, open and close these windows. Um, it has its own bathroom upstairs as a loft so I can sleep out here. And sometimes when I paint late at night, I'll just drop the ladder down and go upstairs and stay in the loft. It's got a little kitchen in here, which is nice, coffee maker, refrigerator. So it's kind of a self-enclosed little unit, but it's my happy place. And uh, it's got all the things I dig on it, like on the wall or little bugs, I dig bugs, so <laughs> imagine that. So I trade these bugs from other artists. They like my paintings and I like their bugs, so we, we trade out. So I got some cool bugs from around the world. And, I wanted to be a baseball player my whole life. I was a college baseball player, I was a college baseball coach. That's how I got here coaching at Florida Southern. And I thought I was gonna be a professional baseball player. Well, at the time, I was in junior college in Arizona and our schedule didn't match the high school schedule. So I'd be out of college and I'd come home and I'd stay out with my buddies who were also home from college and dad's getting up in the morning going to school and I'm sleeping until noon. Right. He comes home at lunch and I'm just rolling out of bed. Well, that lasted about three days. And he's like, you get out of bed with me and go to school with me and hang out if you're gonna be home. And that's probably where it started. So that was probably 17, 18 years old. That's when I really started doing things. Was this building here when you moved here or did you build it? No, when I bought the home, it was way back. It was just an empty lot. And the yards changed a bunch too. The yard's real magical. Um, I built the building, I built the studio here. It wasn't here, but the yard prior to this last hurricane 
was built for birds and butterflies. That's what it was for. And, and you come out here and you need an air traffic controller. There were so many butterflies. It's just phenomenal. And then this big storm we lost, our, my big oak tree went down. And now the whole yard's kind of going through a, re, a regrowth. Of a, it'll be a different yard, not quite like it was. It had this big spreading oak and now that's gone. But that's, this was all just a lot when I got it. And uh, it's become a real special place to hang out. In. Yeah, so there was always this place to go to where I could get away from everything. And you know, it, it's not like a refuge that you go to because you're troubled or anything. It's just right. something I like doing. I'd rather sit there and paint a painting than watch something on TV or something like that. I just, I, I guess at that age, I didn't think I could get my head around making a living doing it. You know, because you, it's one of those examples of where you don't know what's possible right. because you've never seen it happen. And I didn't grow up around a working artist. I grew up around a guy that got paid to teach at school and teach art. You know, so I never had that model of a working artist that can actually go out there and get it done. Did your dad do art fairs and no. travel around and do that stuff? Or you see, they weren't even on the radar, man. I didn't know about an art fair until the 90s, okay. the early 90s. When I came to Florida Southern to coach and coached at Southern, I was painting in my hotel, in my apartment room, you know, and stuff like that. But it was just painting for me, and they just start stacking up. And, and it's, it's funny how the career started that way, but that's how it started. And then some friends saw it, and. They said, you know, you ought to put these in the Ducks Unlimited Inc. And at that time, Ducks Unlimited was huge. Quail Unlimited, all those conservation organizations were really drawing big crowds and, and doing well. And that's how I started. Somebody's in my apartment going, man, that duck looks really good. You need to put that in the DU auction. And it just took off after that. Um, it was, I knew I wanted to have a place to come paint. And at the time, my wife, who's passed, at the time, you know, I'm typically going to build it smaller than I should. And she said, you need to build this a little bit bigger so it, it's okay for you. And so it was comprised as a, a big enough area to paint in, a place where people could come and hang out. And in the beginning, before I was teaching workshops, there were couches out, there's a couch and chair out here. So people could chill out and watch me paint, we could talk, whatever. Now it's more of a working studio. So it's set up to teach people how to paint or for me to come out here and paint and have the things I need to do, like not have to go in the house for the restroom and have a nice kitchen here with stuff to get to. So it's, it's, it's really a self-enclosed place where I can come be Steve. My very first art show was in Winter Haven. I was so pitiful, man. I had like three or four easels. I didn't even have a tent. And there was a guy named John Yakel who's no longer in around, but he was a really good watercolor wildlife artist. And John, and, and so cool in the, in the wildlife world. It's, I don't know how it is with the other artists, but in the wildlife world, there's no, there's no real animosity or competition. It's, it's like everybody kind of is on the same page and they want to help each other. And, and that's how I live too. I want to help everybody too. Right. He's like, son, you, you can do this, but you've got to do this, 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 and this. And then another artist, Ben Essenberg, who's also not around anymore, Ben kind of took me under the wing and said, this is the kind of tent you need. These are the walls you need. And it just took off from there. You know, the first Mayfair I did, I built my walls. I mean, it, it looked like a shanty. It was just, but, your first show that you did, how many paintings did you bring with you? Do you I, remember? Yeah, at that time I had two reproductions, that's all I had, and, and I probably had 15 originals. You know, and, and I've since learned, and I can, I tell people all the time, there is a little formula to street shows. If you have too many originals, you don't sell. It, it's like there's too much choice, at least with right. me. You know, and there's a magic number for me that kind of fluctuates. But yeah, I think I had maybe 20 paintings in the booth, and. Man, we sold like crazy. I mean, it stunned me too. And I, I was stunned. And I remember Sunday just thinking, God, now I paint from the iPad. And I set it up here. I get my, my reference photos in the iPad. Sometimes I'll get photos that somebody says, hey, I got this great praying mantis. I want you to paint it for me. And I'm like, I love praying mantises, so I'll do it. But you can see, I got to make up everything in there because you really can't make anything from it. So I'm just kind of, and people know me now well enough. They said, I just paint it, whatever you think. And so it, it works out really good. But. It's been an evolution, and, and that's, I think we should all just keep trying to grow. You, there's something else, too, that's kind of cool, and I see it in young artists all the time. You do this painting, and then somebody says, I want to buy it, and you're like, I don't want to sell it. I don't know if I can do that again. I mean, and I think that really is what people think when they're young and they're working. They're like, that's the best thing I've ever painted. I don't know if I can ever do that again. But the truth is, you can do it again. Right. You know, and that was a, a hurdle I had to learn through, too, is that, you know, but I'll tell you what, when you, when you sell a reproduction, you're tickled to death. When you sell an original, you remember. I mean, it's it's like they're buying a part of you. They're buying a piece of you. And I've never done a painting to sell it. You do the painting because you love it. This is a typical palette. It's the Masterson Stay With. I love it because it's got a sponge in the bottom and then there's a little piece of paper and then I put paper towel over the top of that. 
And that's my palette. That's all I need, little dollops of paint like that. And this is just where the paint lives. It lives there, but it's mixed on these little ceramic bowls. So you can see how many different greens I'm playing with different mixes as I'm painting. These little ceramics, you can buy these stacked. You can paint on, use both sides. And then I clean the whole thing out and start again. I'm doing now what I love the most. And, and I really do, you know, I said earlier, my church is out there and, and I, I feel the best in the wild. I, and I just, it's, it's like all the senses heightened. One of the hardest parts about starting a painting is just where to start. After you get your initial composition sketched out on your surface, where do you start painting? Do you paint in the background, foreground, middle ground, or start with the main subject? I start as far away as you see. That's always been my rule. And I know there's lots of artists that paint the animal. A really good friend of mine does that, beautiful art. He paints the animal and paints all the stuff around right. it. You know, and I, I, looking at those approaches when I first started, I would, I was, I think I was kind of always in love with the landscape. I, I, so right now I'm probably a landscape wildlife artist. I really dig the landscape. So I, my method is paint as far away as you can see and work towards the viewer. And in my early years, I would paint the landscape and I'd take my, my sketch and I'd cut out the animal and I'd tape him on there and move him around. Because at that time in my mind, it hadn't formed yet. It, it was, it, I knew I wanted to paint this animal, but I didn't know where I wanted to place him in the painting. So that little, you know, I'd take that little thing and I'd put it there and I'd sit back and look at it and, you know, is that what I wanted? My mind has changed since then. It's, it's now, when I start painting, Matt, the whole painting's in my head. The whole thing. And I used to tell people, I've got all these airplanes flying around waiting for a runway. And when they get the runway, they go in. When Stephen first starts working on his paintings, he does what most artists will do. He pulls out a sketchbook and creates little thumbnail sketches, not very detailed, but just enough to tell him where the darks and lights are gonna be. I do sketch it. It's incredibly crude though. It's, it's a very crude piece. Like, and my sketching is more to do with exactly what you said. Not much detail, but just where the lights and darks are gonna be. And I'll move the critter around. I'll stay away from the center. You know, I'll put part of them in the center or something like that. But most of my paintings are stories. So as I'm, as I'm painting the piece, I'm also thinking about the story I'm trying to paint. Right. And they're, they're subtle, you know, and, and some of them, some of them are, they all probably need to be explained when people look at them, but there are, there are people that come in the booth and go, I see what was going on here. He was doing this to this, and this was going to happen. But those stories kind of also tell me where the light's going to come from. You know, and I tell students all the time when I paint, my painting is like a play. You have your backdrop, you have your supporting cast, and you have your star. And the star is the guy that really matters. The supporting cast, you do pretty good. Backdrop, not so big a deal, right. you know. So yeah, it, I do sketch it. It's a little thumbnail, man, and it's so crude. It's just a little rectangle, it'll be dark light animal. And that's all I start with once I go. And this is the, these are the boards. This is, this is the, one of those boards we we're talking about, the um, Jack Richardson boards. This is what they look like on the back. And then this is a piece in process. And you can see how I start as far away as you can see, and I slowly work my way towards the viewer. So who knows what's gonna happen down here, but I'm just trying to rough it in. I'll go back and tighten up some of that stuff later. So you don't have a plan of what's gonna be the no, foreground? You just, no, just let it come as yeah, it is? just let it go as it happens. Most of his career, Stephen has been a professional artist, but it wasn't always that way. There was a point where he went from just being an art hobbyist to being a true pro. I think I know this answer. It was 1993. In 1993 is when it really started. Um, we had just gone through Hurricane Andrew and all state. I was writing policies. I was doing great. And then Andrew hits and we lose a whole bunch we can't do. And at that point, my deal with all state, I, and I've told people this ahead of time, I've already been, I've, I've confessed, you know, that the goal was just to get paid until I could be an artist. Yeah. You know, that was really the goal. And, I made it to 94 and in 95 I went full time, but in 93 I started doing the shows. So man, I, I look back now and I wasn't sleeping a whole lot. I mean, I was busting my tail. I was, I was in that office five days a week and do whatever I had to do there. I'd load my car up Friday night and drive somewhere and do an art show all weekend, come back Sunday night, unload the car, go to work Monday morning and start all over again. But it's so cool when you're after something, you have this drive, right. this, this, this relentless drive to do it. And, and it's fun, man, it's not work. You know, I can't look back on any part of this and say it was, it was hard or work, you know, or something I didn't like doing. Here's another thing too. You know, with the, with the plastic palettes, 
If you're going like this, that pallet's sliding all over the table. This thing has some weight and some body, so as I'm mixing here, there's no movement at all. It stays placed and easy to clean, like you said, doesn't stain. They're really, I really like this. So that's, that's also part of what the workshop teaches is your paints live one place and you mix somewhere else. You know, look back, at, I was really lucky because we had a famous artist around here that was pretty well known, Robert Butler. I'm sure you've heard the name mm -hmm. Robert Butler. Well, I was, I was I'm, I'm still a Robert Butler fan. I think, I, I, you know, I don't paint like Robert, but I was able to watch Robert and I was able to see how he did things. And so I knew I didn't want to starve. I mean, I knew that. And I didn't want to give the work away either. I didn't want to be the starving artist. And that's why, actually, when I quit with Allstate, I was making more painting than I was with Allstate. Hmm. So I had built up in the art show circuit where I had a steady set of shows every year, and I was making more income doing art than I was with Allstate. So it really wasn't a starvation year or anything like that. It was just, hey, wow. And something else really happened that was cool too. When I quit splitting my mind, when I wasn't trying to wear two hats, man, the art just jumped. There, there are three or four periods in my life where the art would plateau a little bit and then something happened and just jump again. Do you and think again. it's because you had more time to focus on? Yes, yes, I was zoned in. And one of the pieces I did when I went full time was still on the wall in the house. It's called Yin and Yang. It was a little butterfly laying on the ground. And man, it's just, it, it was just a smoking piece. And it, I'm, I'm at an art show, it's raining, nobody's there. And I'm standing in front of the booth and I'm looking at the rain puddle and the painting just goes, and I couldn't wait to get home and start. But that piece was awesome. And that piece kind of told me, you can do this, man. Now that, you're, now that your focus is on what you're doing, you can, you can really step the art up another level. And, and every day I try to get better. And that, that was one of the jumps was going full time. me, I think a successful painting is a painting that speaks to somebody of what you're thinking about. You know, we, in the, in the wildlife art world, we have a thing, it's just a, a, a little term, it's called the essence of the animal. It means if you paint that animal right, they don't really need to look at it to know what it is. Boom, it's there. You've captured the essence of that animal. And I think when you can capture the essence of a landscape or the essence of the animal you're painting, or even the essence of a person, that's a successful painting. And I, I used to be, st I used to really, you know, you do all of this, you look back on your young career as an artist and you're, you're looking at the rule of thirds and compositional rules and right. man, you can get paralysis through analysis. You know, you get all this going on about how to make a good painting and I've got my, the balance is right and all that. Well, there's this magical thing that happens when you absorb all that information and don't, don't dwell, it becomes you and it comes out. And I think that I'm, I'm at that point. I mean, I think that the composition just happens, but I think if you boiled it down, it's the essence. If you can capture the essence of what you're trying to do, then you've done a good job. For those artists aspiring to get their work out into the art fairs and doing street fairs, Stephen has some great advice of how you can attract your buyers. So I go to Africa, I come back, I paint this boatload of African stuff, and I think I load the booth up and nothing happens, man. You know, somebody comes in and goes, I want that, I went to Africa, I want that, I went to Africa. But the other people are like, oh, nice zebra, yeah. nice elephant. You know, so, but then I go to another show, and, and you know, so it's really regional. They, and snow doesn't sell in Florida. I learned that the hard mm -hmm. way, too. You can paint snow here, and unless somebody from Michigan's down visiting, it. yeah, they're not buying snow. So I think if I were gonna tell a young artist something, I know what I'd tell them. I'd say, paint to the subject that the pe where the show is. You know, if you if you live in Florida, paint water birds, paint birds, um, maybe deer, maybe turkey. You know, things that are here that people see all the time. In your booth, have a wide selection of sizes if you can. You don't have to have all originals. You know, actually, I said earlier that there's a little formula. In my booth, if I have more than seven originals, I don't sell them because it's almost as if there's too much there for them to make a decision on. If I have seven or less, I'll usually sell an original a show. Reproductions sell really well, but people buy the things they see in Florida. They, when we go out west, they buy the western animals. We had two sets of work, western mm -hmm. and here. You know, we, there's all kinds of genres to paint in this pie. The biggest slice of that pie is stuff people can identify with. It's not the little things that just come out of your head you had to do. You know, you do stuff that's going to identify with a larger group of people. And I think that's, that's why wildlife does so well, because more people identify with wildlife. You would think one of the hardest parts about 
selling your work at the street fairs would be just attracting your customers in. But there's another element that throws a kink in your plans. Probably the, the toughest thing is, and, and you, you have to give a show two years. The toughest thing is you don't know if you're gonna do good or not. You really don't know. You know, it's a roll of the dice. Um, obviously the costs, and that's, that's probably what's toughest on a young artist is you have to go in there and you have to look like you know what you're doing. You can't look like, hey, this is my first art show. And you've got booth fees, jury fees, hotel, gas. Right. Before you ever sell a thing, you got those costs. Um, so that's the part you sweat as an artist is, man, I've, I've spent this much money. I sure hope I sell something out here. Then setting up the tent, that kind of stuff, which I enjoy. I really enjoy setting up the tent. But there's really not a drawback at a show if you take weather out of the equation, you know? Mm -hmm. we're, we're subject to whatever Mother Nature wants to do to you. And, and there have been some pretty hairy shows. I've, I mean, a painting went under my booth in water in Roanoke, Virginia from the guy next door. Oh. You know, it's, so you see stuff like this, but the booths now and the way we set them up, they're pretty tough. They, they, they shed the water well. And so, you know, now shows to me are just fun. They're, I, I really like talking about the painting, not about me. And I think young artists make that mistake too. They think they have to sell themselves. They have to sell, they don't. All they have to talk about is what they were doing. One of the parts about growing as an artist is being able to have thick skin if you wanna be able to show your work. And, you know, in the beginning, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, all those fears young artists have. And I, you know, you're, you're really hanging your heart out there. Right. And, and you, you, you hang it out there and somebody comes in the booth and goes, that bird doesn't look like that. And they leave and somebody else comes in and they just whistle at the price like, he's really proud of himself. He wants that much for this. You know, and you get all kinds of stuff out there. And in the beginning, your skin's really thin. And as you get on, you start building calluses up and you get pretty thick skinned. And, and, you know, I would get, when I'd apply to shows and not get in, I'd get offended. And, you know, you don't think there's 2,000 other people trying to get in the show, mm -hmm. you know, and they just didn't happen to like yours. And then you come to this realization that, you know, you just throw it out there and, and if they like it, they like it, you know, and now it's like I paint, I paint what I, what's in my heart. I try to get the essence of the animal and I just apply and if it works, it works. It's it in the beginning, it was kind of like a mantle, like the more you win, the more you get in, the cooler you are. That That's not even part of my, my makeup anymore. And I, I'm. You know, if, if I win something, if I get in something, yippee, that's cool, enjoy the moment, but it's just the next day you may not. One of the questions I'm always curious about when I talk to people about art is what is their definition of art? Because everybody's perspective of what makes a good painting is different. And Stephen has one of the best responses that I've ever heard. Beauty. Seriously, beauty. You know, I just, like I told you earlier, I want to be moved by stuff. It doesn't have to be a detail painting. It doesn't have to be realism. Um, there's some beautiful impressionistic stuff, and and there's some beautiful, you know, neoclassical works. I mean, a lot of it, I just want to see beauty. And I guess if I dig deeper into it, I want to see a commitment to the piece. And that might be part of the detail in me, part of the the guy that wants to paint something in realism. Is I want to see a commitment to doing a good job. You know, I I've, I've done good paintings that I just threw the threw at the wall but right. they're not my best. And there was really no commitment. I was just throwing it at the wall. I, I guess I, I'm looking for beauty and I'm looking for commitment. When you go to purchase paints at the art store or online, you have many different options to choose from. One of those is do you buy student grade paint or do you buy professional grade paint? Steven has some advice about that. I, I paint with a paint that's professional grade paint. And, and why do you choose professional? Because the thickness of the pigment. The, the density, the saturation of pigmentation. That paint will go further, it will be more vibrant, it will be more alive, less chance to turn into mud. It's just phenomenal. So I started Liquitex and Grumbacher mm -hmm. acrylics. And I was painting with Liquitex and acrylic and Grumbacher and I was doing a show, it might have been Gasparilla in Tampa. And this was back when cavemen were still around and this lady walks in the booth and she's like, I'm a representative for a company called Joe Sonia out of Australia and I want you to try our paints. And I said, sure, send them to me thinking I'm never going to see you right. right here at nothing. Week later, I get every medium they make, every paint they make, boxes. And I started using them and I still use them today. They're the best paint on planet Earth in my mind. They're just heavily pigmented. The color range is phenomenal. That's mm -hmm. what those are hanging up there. 
Um, it's water-based, it's easy on the brush, it's not hard, there's no smell. I mean, I have some students that can't have any of the solid right. smells and stuff, no smell to the paint, and the colors are just stunning. So my favorite paint's made in Australia. It's sold in America as Joe Sonia's, let's see, they changed the name three times. Um, the tubes have gone through all kinds of different iterations in, in life, and it's funny, they came, when they first hit America, they were called Artists Gouache. And North American artists were scared to death of gouache, so they didn't sell them. Because, God, what's gouache? Right. So then they changed the name to Artists Acrylic Gouache. That still didn't happen. Then they And I was painting with the original tubes. And then they started calling it Matte Flow Acrylic, and that's the paint I use right now. It's made in Australia by a company called Chroma, and it's called Joe Sonia's Artist Colors Matte Flow Acrylic. And I'll tell you what, that tube's four bucks. Hmm. And it lasts and lasts and lasts. I use, you know, I, I, I use a brush called a rake brush, R-A-K-E, and there's several companies that make these rake brushes. And the, the difference of the rake brush is you can get a filbert head that's rounded or a flat head, but at the top of the brush where the bristles are, they're split like this. Okay. So you can do hair, grasses, all kinds of stuff with that brush real quickly and real easily. But the real thing with that brush that makes you teach or makes you become a better artist is you can't press too hard. One of the tenets we teach, I've taught, and I use myself, is caress the board. Don't press too hard. Mix right, work on your mix, and let the paint flow. Caress the board. So that rake brush allows, makes them caress it, so they don't have all these little streaks in it. And it, so it's a dynamite brush for several uses, but more than that, it makes you caress the board. It, it teaches you a softer touch as an artist. And I'm a big believer in layers, not heavy, right. and heavy <laughs> applications. A, a big believer in layers. Um, for detail, I love a brush made by a company called King Art, and it's it, they call it their Max Round. Um, in the old days, it was called an Ultra Round made by a company called Low Cornell. Low Cornell quit making it, now King Art makes it. And it, it what it does is it, it comes in odd sizes, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, um, has a fat little body on it, and holds a point beautifully. So it holds a lot of paint, so you get a bunch of strokes, you're not going back every stroke to reload. Beautiful brush. It's right here. Um, it's my my, fav my favorite brush for detail. It's a, it's a number four. This is the old Low Cornell brush. Um, the only difference with the brush is this one has a silver, a gold tip on it. This is the new style with the gold. Same brush. They just, just put, different colors. And they named it differently, yeah. But these, these ultra rounds are the brush. And I, I got a bunch I'll show you if you want. These ultra rounds are just dynamite, but they got a fat body. So they hold a lot of, a lot of paint and, and water. I make sure that I keep my tip is where the paint is. The whole bristle's not full of paint, just probably the first half, and that allows the capillary action to keep going. Another decision that you have to make when purchasing art materials is just what is the surface that you're going to be painting on. For example, when I go to paint with my watercolors, I like to choose a 300 pound Arches watercolor paper. When I paint with my acrylics, my preferred choice is the pre-stretch canvases. Steven has another option to paint on. I confession, I haven't painted on a canvas in about 20 years. Oh. I paint on a hard board. And, and like I, a masonite board? Yes, masonite board. And it's it's curious because my dad, and and this is a good story, it's he 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 wanted he was such a good helper. You know, he, he lived in Arizona so he couldn't be with me at shows, but he wanted me to paint and in the art department they decided to take out all these lockers on this wall. Well the dividers were all masonite. So dad takes all those dividers, cuts them in different sizes and coats them with gesso and sends me a box every two or three months that weighs 300 pounds full of <laughs> gesso boards. And at the first box, he'd had the, the gesso pieces together so the boards wouldn't come apart, you know? And so we had to go through this education thing. Dad, put a piece of paper between them or face them outward. But he used to make my boards and then I started making my boards. And you can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, buy a four by eight sheet of hardboard, cut it in the sizes you want and then just gesso it. I used to do that and then I learned you have to put a fixative on that board before the gesso so that nothing migrates up into your paint. So I put this, it's called a, it's called a, a retarder, Josanya, the brand I use, Josanya makes a retarder. So I cut the boards, I brush the retarder over it, let it dry, and then I start putting the gesso on. And I put the gesso on curiously in a canvas pattern. One application this way, one this way. And I do it till I can't see any of that brown underneath there. Give it a little wet sand, a little dry sand, and then maybe one more coat. Oh, Bubba, I love you. Man, I love music. I got headphones in here. I, pop, I, uh -huh. I listen to ACDC. I was listening to ACDC today. I, I love 
all kinds of music. You know, I mean, ACDC, um, Train, uh, and then you get into the country stuff. I'm into Billy Strings, and Billy Strings is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. You know, um, what's this other guy? Spurlock or Spessard or something? Anyway, there's another guy Billy, in Billy Strings genre. But I, I love music, and, and it's it's cool. You know, you you put it on and just play. And we got this thing going, Melanie and I, where she'll, she'll be working, and she'll send me a text, listen to this. You know, and so I'll deep dive. You know, I'm in her paint, so I'll listen to the song, and then I'll get on Apple Music and listen to all of the stuff. But I think music is another form of art that is just brilliant. I'm an artist, man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, it, I don't know. I, you know, it, I, could, I can definitively say green. All, all phases of green are, are one of my favorites, but I love purple. I love lavenders. And I love black. I know there's a lot of artists that don't don't use black or say don't use black. I think black is boom. Black can make a painting just pop. The next one. Rake brush. The rake brush. Watercolor. Really? Yeah, I I did I you know I spent two summers in Africa and got 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 to be there for free as a game guide, but it was really just go to Africa with an artist. And so I took field kits, the Cotman field kit, and thinking, mm -hmm. hell, I'll paint watercolor over here. Man, I just made my I just my psyche doesn't match watercolor, and I really believe people's psyche do mass match certain mediums, and that's where it started. You know, no matter how I tried, dry brush, wet brush, da 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 da, right. it just looked like a watercolor. It didn't go boom. You know, now I know people that can make a watercolor stun you, just stunning, and it's just, it's just not my thing. Stick with it. We, we need art, and we touched on it earlier that everybody's an artist. I really believe that. Everybody is. I mean, I, I, you know, when I would do schools and visit kids and 12, 10, 11 year olds, they're all artists. Somewhere in their life that stops, and that shouldn't stop. And it doesn't have to be painting, it's creatives, it's everything. Right. Um, I would, I would tell them stick with it as far as being cerebral about it, pick stuff. You know, you may like doing something that, that and forgive me for being this way, but you may want to do something that's deep and tortured and, and yucky. It fulfills you and it's cool, but you're not going to sell to anybody, you right. know? I mean, I don't want something on the wall every time I look at it, I'm disturbed. I want to look at something that's cool and that makes me feel good. So. You, to be cerebral, pick stuff that you love doing that's going to be a bigger slice of that pie out there. Stick with it, do the legwork, put in the time. There's ways to do this without investing a fortune in it. There are ways, and there's ways to get out there and, and see things and, and also realize everybody's going to try to take advantage of you in the beginning. They want you to give you the painting, give them the painting, or they want to pay nothing for it, or you know, you get a little exposure. And remember, you can die from exposure. So, you know, <laughs> too much exposure can kill you. So. I tell young artists, just stick with it, be cerebral about it, and do what they love. A great opportunity to learn how to paint is by taking one of Steven's workshops that he does in his own studio. You can check out the dates to sign up for one of your own at www.scurry.com. To listen to our full conversation with Steven, you can head to the website www.soundingboardstudios.com.